If you are listening to a recording of this webinar, you will need to go to the Certified Crop Advisor website, log into your account, and self-report the credits. You can ask questions during the webinar by using the chat feature in the dashboard on the right side of your screen. There will be time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation, but please keep your questions brief and to the point. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Victoria Kloschewski. Dr. Kloschewski serves as the Insect and Plant Disease Technical Manager for Growmark. Prior to her job at Growmark, Kloschewski worked as a development scientist for DuPont Crop Protection in the Northeast, where she contributed to the development and launch of specialty and field crop fungicides, insecticides, and seed treatment products. Victoria earned her master's degree and PhD in the Department of Entomology at Purdue University and received her bachelor's degree in agronomy from Zam or Anno University in her native Honduras. I'll hand it over to you now, Victoria. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, for the next 45 minutes, we're going to be uh, reviewing uh, the main uh, insect pests and pathogens that uh, affect soybeans early in the season and are the main target of um, seed treatment uh, products. Um, so why do we put uh, choose a seed treatment? Um, some of the main objectives or purposes of using a seed treatment is to uh, promote rapid and uniform emergence, uh, promote uh, uniform stand, plant health, uh, to mitigate stress early on, um, and that stress can be imposed by uh, early insects and early pathogens, but also uh, environmental uh, conditions uh, that the seed might be encountered with uh, early on. Uh, and also to promote early season vigor that can potentially translate into better yields at harvest. So there's very many different classes of uh, seed treatments. I'm only going to be talking about the first four letters here on these, uh, on these diagram, on this slide that you see here. So we're going to be talking mainly about fungicides and insecticides, which constitute what we know as base seed treatments. Uh, we're also going to be reviewing uh, nematicidal seed treatments and uh, fungicide seed treatments targeting sudden death syndrome. So those are the four things that we're going to be covering uh, throughout this presentation. There's also some other uh, biological products that um, mainly work as inoculants or stimulants. We're not going to talk about any of those here today. But it is important that I mention that some of the nematicidal seed treatments that we are going to be talking about uh, do fall into these biological categories. Okay, so we're going to be reviewing uh, some of the early season uh, insects. We're going to be talking a little bit about their identification and some of the management tools that we have available out there. So I have uh, bee leaf beetles as the number one. Uh, this is probably one of the most uh, common pests uh, of soybeans that we encounter early on. Um, bean leaf beetles uh, have a pretty wide color variation, as you can see here on the middle picture on the right. Some of them might be yellow, some of them are going to be orange, some of them are going to be red. Some of them will have spots and some of them will not have any spots. But the one key characteristic to distinguish uh, bean leaf beetles from other beetles will be the presence of these uh, black triangle, as you can see here on the top picture. This black triangle is found behind their uh, pronotum or behind their thorax, and that black triangle is present on every single uh, bean leaf beetle, regardless of the color variation. So that is one key uh, way to distinguish it. This is a pest that overwinters as an adult, uh, and then when the temperatures warm up uh, in the spring, they start coming out of their overwintering hiding places and uh, feed on those emerging soybean seedlings. Now, uh, they don't always pose a, a threat to soybeans, but what happens is that when the peak on their emergence uh, coincides with uh, soybean emergence, that's when we can have heavy um, 
heavy feeding damage on those early seedlings. So they're going to be feeding on the cotyledons and they're also going to be feeding on those developing trifoliates uh, on soybeans. And uh, the damage uh, from that feeding alone can uh, result in up to 12% um, uh, damage or yield damage or yield reduction. Uh, one of the most important things that these beetles do is that they're also carriers or, or vectors of a virus called the bean pod model virus. Uh, the, the virus alone has been associated with yield reductions that go anywhere from 3% to up to 50% in severe situations. Uh, and so the beetles will acquire the virus from infested uh, weeds or infested uh, soybean residue and transmit it to um, healthy plants. Now, bean leaf beetles are not the only uh, insect that vectors this virus. This uh, virus can also be transmitted by grape colossus, uh, blister beetles, uh, Mexican bean beetles, but uh, bean leaf beetles are by far the most effective uh, vectors of this virus. Uh, and so when you have uh, this virus, you might see some modeling on those leaves, some chlorosis, the plants are gonna be stunted, and the, the yield damage, like I mentioned, is gonna be higher when the virus is present than just from, um, from the feeding damage alone. Um, so, uh, uh, bean leaf beetles is, is one of those pests that can be managed uh, using seed treatment, but there's also uh, various uh, insecticide sprays that can be used in season to control these, these pests. So like I mentioned, they overwinter as an adult. Um, those adults will feed on soybeans, uh, mate, lay eggs. Uh, those eggs will hatch and give rise to another generation in the summer. So we actually have a couple of more generations in the summer that uh, will be feeding on soybean leaves, but also on pods. And is that pod damage that um, can be a lot more detrimental to yield. Uh, the one thing that it's important to mention is that the seed treatment packages that we put on soybeans now will not have any activity on those uh, late summer uh, generations because the residual will be uh, worn off. But if we suppress the population of those overwintering adults, we might end up with fewer beetles uh, and fewer damage later on. So one of the things that we have in our favor um, is that the winter temperatures can uh, result in significant levels of mortality. So harsh winters have been associated with uh, pretty high mortality uh, levels on these, uh, on these beetles. So uh, some of the work that was done at Iowa State uh, has shown that uh, under uh, temperatures of 14 degrees or, or less for just a few hours, uh, there's going to be about 50% mortality of these beetles. Um, and then when the temperatures get between 15 and 20 some degrees uh, for a few days, that can also impose some pretty high levels of mortality uh, on these beetles. And based on that information, um, researchers at Iowa State developed these uh, models, and I know this is a map of Iowa, uh, but they developed these models to predict mortality of, uh, of bean leaf beetles. So if you remember last winter, 2018 to 2019, was a pretty cold uh, winter overall. Uh, so based on the um, winter temperatures or sub-freezing temperatures, they uh, predicted uh, levels of up to 99% mortality on some of those uh, areas in Iowa, which meant, uh, you know, these areas with pretty high levels of mortality shouldn't have been too concerned about uh, bean leaf beetles uh, causing damage. Um, then uh, I found this other map from 2011 to 2012 where I wasn't here, I was in the Northeast, but uh, that must have been kind of a milder winter. And as you can see here, um, the levels of mortality uh, were a lot less uh, for, uh, for bean leaf beetles. So this was potentially a year where uh, damage was gonna be a little heavier, okay? So, um, so the, the, winter can, the winter temperatures can help us a lot to predict the potential for these beetles to cause damage. 
Some of the other risk scenarios for these uh, pests is uh, alfalfa fields that are nearby, because that's an alternate host for these, uh, for these pests. If there is a history of the virus uh, in your particular field, that can also represent a risk scenario because those overwintering, overwintering beetles will get the virus from, um, from these infected plants and potentially transmit it to, to newly uh, planted uh, fields. Uh, food grade and seed acres, those are gonna be probably uh, acres where uh, seed treatments uh, can provide a lot more value to. And then uh, uh, if you are in an area where your soybeans are the first ones to emerge, um, that can also uh, represent a high risk scenario because those overwintering beetles are going to be attracted to those uh, beans and really do a heavy damage if those are the, the, the first beans to emerge, okay? Another pest that we think of as an occasional pest is grape colossus. So uh, grape colossus uh, is a grub, as you can see here on the top right. It looks a lot like a white grub, but it is a lot smaller in size, uh, probably about a quarter of an inch long. And so the grub will feed on roots of corn and soybeans, both. Uh, the damage can look like stunted plants or plants that just came out of the ground and died, uh, missing, missing uh, plants in the sand or gaps in the rows uh, that can be associated with, uh, with gray colossus. The adults are these uh, tiny uh, beetles, uh, about a sixth of an, a sixth of an inch long, uh, kind of tan color, and they have these uh, uh, rows of punctures on their wings or their elytra, or the, their wing covers or their, their elytra. The beetles themselves don't cause a whole lot of damage. They do a little bit of feeding on soybean leaves. As you can see down on this picture on the left, uh, they will do these like kind of circular um, holes uh, on soybean leaves. And they actually move to soybean fields, even if they come out of corn fields, they will move to soybean fields to feed and mate and lay eggs. So potentially those uh, uh, situations where we have beans followed by beans where you had heavy pressure of gray colossus the previous year might be at a higher risk for uh, damage by the grub stage uh, these growing seasons. Uh, mainly because those beetles are going to be laying eggs in there um, and those eggs are going to hatch and uh, that grub is going to come up to, uh, to those top few inches of the soil in the spring and start looking for roots to feed on. We don't really know a whole lot about how winter temperatures affect these pests. Um, we don't really know uh, much about how wet falls versus dry falls affect their survival. Uh, but the potential for, for damage can be higher if you had beans on beans where you had heavy pressure in the previous year. Uh, we don't have any rescue treatments for these pests. Uh, and usually when we talk about seed treatments, the high rate of uh, insecticide seed treatments is what's needed to control these pests. Another one uh, that uh, we uh, can really pose a big threat to soybeans and corn both is uh, seed corn maggots. Um, and last year I went on a call where uh, there was pretty heavy, probably one of the heaviest damage of seed corn maggots that I've seen um, in, in Illinois. Uh, so uh, seed corn maggot, it's a, it's a fly. Um, so you can see here on the, on the lower right, uh, the fly looks a lot like, uh, like a house fly kind of like a brown uh, gray in color with red eyes. So those flies are actually gonna be attracted to uh, fields with manure, uh, fields with green vegetation, moist uh, soils with high organic matter. Those will be ideal sites for those flies to lay eggs, okay? So, um, so those flies are gonna be laying eggs, the eggs are gonna hatch, and then the larva, which is this uh, pale legless uh, larva with paper heads, they don't really have a head, they have a, kind of like a black uh, mouth uh, that they use to feed. Those, uh, those larva or those maggots are gonna be looking for 
uh, seeds to, to feed on. And so they will feed on the embryo and they can delay development or kill the plant altogether. So we do have a couple other generations, two or three more generations during the growing season, but that first generation is usually the one that uh, can cause a lot more damage to soybeans and corn rows uh, because this is the time when those, uh, when those uh, seeds are, are emerging, when those seedlings are coming out of the ground and uh, temperatures are usually a lot cooler um, in April and May. So um, the, the one field that I went to uh, last year, if you remember last year was such a, a challenging season, um, this was actually a field that has had manure in it and the growers were able to, to plant the crop in April. But because the planting was followed by such wet and cool conditions, it took a long time for those uh, soybeans to emerge and come out of the ground. And uh, yet April and May were pretty ideal time for the adults to come out and lay eggs and for the maggots to infest. So um, we started noticing that there were missing plants in the stand um, and there were, um, there were plants that were dying. When we pull out those plants, we were finding anywhere from three to about nine maggots per seed. Um, so, you know, in some of those areas we're planting, um, it's really the only way to, uh, to, to fix the problem because we don't really have a rescue treatment for these pests. Another thing to keep in mind is that this is a pest that is active at a, at a, at a very low temperature. Uh, for most insects, um, you know, they start becoming active in the late 40s or early 50 degree temperatures. Uh, this pest has a, a low developmental threshold of 39 degrees. So in the early 40 degree temperatures, they start to become active. So we think about seed corn maggots as an early, cool, and wet type of pest, okay? Then uh, we also have uh, wire worms. And so wire worms, and I personal, personally will say that I have yet to go on a call uh, where wire worms have caused a significant amount of damage. Um, so there's, there's, however, certain risk scenarios for wire worms. So uh, fields that have been com converted from pasture uh, will be high risk for wire worms because the, uh, you know, the pasture will provide a pretty good habitat for them. And when soybeans are planted after um, small grains, those will also represent high risk scenarios for wire worms. This is a pest that attacks corn and soybeans as uh, the same. Uh, they will feed on the seed germ and they may, they're actually able to tunnel into the stem or the root. Uh, so the plants will wilt um, or die, uh, and they they result in the damage results in what we call a dead heart. Okay, so the the wireworm itself it's a uh, a legless larva, as you can see here on the on the lower left. Um, kind of uh, there's different species, so based on the species, the color uh, the color can change from a light orange to a dark brown. So the bodies are segmented, and if you were to grab them, they're going to feel uh, very hard, almost like a wire. So the larva is going to be the one causing the damage. The adults, which are uh, called click beetles, will not cause, uh, will not feed on crops. The challenging thing about these wireworms is that they have multi-year life cycles. What I mean by that is that their life cycles can last anywhere from four to seven years, depending on the species. So if you do have wire worms in your field this year, those uh, worms or those larvae will be in that larval stage for a couple more years, possibly, okay? Um, they're, they're an issue early in the season, but as, because later in the season, as the temperatures warm up and the soil warms up, they tend to move deeper into the soil profile, so as to they're not really going to be feeding uh, on your crop much at all. And so, uh, so we talked about the risk scenarios. I will tell you one of the best and most accurate ways to really find out whether wireworms are present or not is by setting up what we call bait stations. So 
So the bait will be composed of untreated wheat and corn seeds. You dig these holes in the ground and bury the seed about um, six inches deep. Then you cover that, that bait with a black plastic, mainly to heat up that mixture uh, because the, the, the wire worms are going to be attracted to that CO2 that's released by those, uh, by those seeds. You really want some of those seeds to, to emerge. And so, you know, you leave it alone, put a flag in there uh, so that you know where they are and you can come back to check those baits. Uh, and so about a couple of weeks after, uh, you come back and check the mixture and see if uh, wireworms are present. So I'll say if we start finding one or two wireworms per bait station, we can start uh, getting concerned about uh, wireworms potentially being a problem in that field. So these bait stations, you really want to set them up before planting so that you can take measures if you have enough time to take measures if the um, if the, the numbers are high, okay? And so like with, with seed corn maggots, there's no rescue treatment for wireworms either. So this is something, a decision that you have to make in advance on whether to, to put a seed treatment or a soil insecticide uh, prior to planting or at planting, okay? Um, and then the other pest that I wanted to talk about is white grubs. And so uh, this is also a pest of both corn and soybeans. The grubs themselves will be feeding on root hairs. They will also be feeding on organic matter, uh, but the feeding on the roots can cause some stunted plants, some chlorosis. On corn, you tend to see uh, purple corn. Uh, there's different species of white grubs that we deal with. Uh, the grub is this creamy color uh, grub with a brown head. Um, it is very hard to distinguish these grubs, but if you grab a pair of lenses and you look at the tip of their abdomen, you're gonna find uh, what we call the raster pattern, which is uh, an arrangement of an arrangement of hairs um, on the tip of their abdomen. And based on the arrangement of those hairs, you can kind of distinguish one species from the other one. Uh, the adult stages are pretty easy to distinguish because they have, you know, very characteristic colors and shapes and, and sizes, but the growth stage is a little challenging. Uh, so just to give you an example here, the May beetle here on the left, or what we call the true white grub, uh, this is potentially the one that we're gonna be a little bit, a little more concerned about because uh, this is a grub that has a three-year life cycle. It means it takes about three years for them to turn into an adult. So these grub will potentially spend a couple of growing seasons in the grub stage. So if you are finding a lot of uh, true grubs or, or may beetles uh, in your field this year, uh, they'll potentially going to be uh, present next year. A good proportion of them will still be in the larval stage uh, next year. So, so looking at the raster pattern for that May beetle or the true white grub, you can see there's a couple of parallel lines of hairs. That is one way how we distinguish this one from a Japanese beetle grub, for example, that's next to it. So the Japanese beetle grub will have uh, more of a V-shaped uh, pattern to them. And then the mass chaser, which is also, you know, commonly found, will not really have any distinctive shape to them. The hairs will be arranged kind of in a, new, a uniform way. And so uh, Japanese beetles and mass chafers are, are both uh, annual grubs, meaning they complete their cycle in one year. They have one generation per year. So, you know, those beetles will emerge and potentially go lay eggs in a different uh, field. So having Japanese beetles and mass chafers in there this year doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have the same growth problem next year because those beetles might move away and go lay eggs somewhere else. So I uh, try to summarize these insect uh, portion here in this table, just kind of talking a little bit about the risk scenarios where uh, seed treatment might be justified. Uh, so in the case of bean leaf beetles, we, we talked a little bit about how winter temperatures affect their survival. Uh, so during mild winters or warmer winters, 
we expect a high uh, survival of these overwintering beetles that will be feeding on soybean seedlings, and there's a high potential for that early season damage. So in those situations, uh, the use of a seed treatment uh, may be very well uh, be justified. Um, however, if we do have more of a harsh winter, very cold temperatures, uh, we are going to expect a low bean fetal survival. So in that case, uh, seed treatments uh, will really not um, be necessary, okay? When we talk about seed corn maggots, uh, planting early into those wet soils or cold temperatures, if manure is used, uh, if uh, I have some green vegetation in that field, those are going to be pretty ideal sites for these uh, uh, flies to come and lay their eggs. So those situations will be, uh, you know, justified to use uh, a seed treatment. Um, however, if we're planting a little later than normal, when temperatures are a lot warmer, conditions are a lot more favorable for, for emergence and plant growth, and the soils are a lot drier, then uh, we're not going to be uh, too worried about uh, uh, seed treatments. I did talk about manure and how uh, freshly tilled fields are uh, attractive sites for these flies to go and lay eggs. Um, however, if we are doing you know, those practices, it is recommended to wait 10 days to maybe two weeks after manure application or after uh, working the ground to, uh, to plant that will uh, prevent damage by that you know, first generation of seed corn maggots because they may have completed development before the crop is in the ground. Um, in terms of wireworms, so the, some of the highest uh, the high risk scenarios will be uh, fields that have been converted from pasture or sod. If you have small grains um, that preceded the soybean crop, and very importantly, if you do have a history of wireworm damage or you set up those bait stations and you're finding uh, two or more uh, wireworms for bait stations, then um, seed treatments in this case may be justified. But then again, this is a pest that I, I have yet to go on a call where uh, the damage has been uh, severe. So knowing your history, it's really important. And then in the case of Y grubs, um, again, these are also uh, a pest of, of uh, grasses and corn. Uh, so if we do have uh, soybeans that have been uh, to, uh, on pasture uh, the previous year, can have a higher risk for uh, y grub damage. Um, so those things are really important to keep track of the history of your field and what you saw there the previous year. So what I mean to say with these um, uh, risk scenarios is that um, insecticide seed treatments may not always be necessary. Uh, and there's actually a pretty nice study that was, that was uh, put together by a lot of uh, researchers in the area where they found that um, uh, they were looking at both insecticide and fungicide seed treatments and the economic benefits obtained from those, uh, from those seed treatments and they actually, one of their, their statements or their conclu conclusions was that early planted fields may benefit from an insecticide seed treatment. And we went over some of the higher risk scenarios and how, um, you know, some of those early cool wet conditions are ideal for some of these pests to come and attack. But if you're planting, uh, you know, later, uh, where the grower con growing conditions are more um, favorable for the crop and the conditions are warmer, uh, there's no yield benefits obtained from um, using insecticide seed treatment. So early planting, yes. Uh, late planting, not much benefit obtained. Okay. And so when it comes to the products available for managing insects, um, it is actually pretty easy because we only have one class of chemistry available as uh, seed treatments. That is the neonicotinoids. There's different actives within, within the neonicotinoids that are um, commercially available um, depending on the product that you choose. The nice thing about these neonics is um, that they are um, have a long residual, so you can expect 
probably about four weeks, uh, 30 days or so, um, maybe a little more of protection because uh, uh, of, of the long residual. And on top of that, these are very high uh, water soluble products. They have really nice uh, silent systemicity. So even though they're put in the seed, uh, they're able to move up and translocate to those growing uh, portions of the plant for a period of time until you know, the residual is worn off. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that different products will have different rates of these insecticides. And so uh, they can go anywhere from 250 to 1250 micrograms of active per seed. Um, there's a couple of pests that we cover here today, like wireworms and grape colapsus, for example, where you're really going to need those high rates of insecticides. If you stick to your 250s um, on wireworms and grape colapsus, those low rates are not really going to help you much with those pests. Okay. So, um, so that was for the insect portion. I'll be happy to take questions here at the end. Um, we also have probably a handful of uh, early season diseases or early season pathogens that we deal with. And so what I try to do here is to group and by the conditions that favor the development and infection of these pathogens. So in the first uh, slide that you see here, these are uh, what we call wet rocks. Uh, so Petium and Phytophthora are all mycids. These are fungal-like organisms that have a tail that allows them to swim in water. So these are pathogens that are prevalent in wet soils, saturated soils, uh, where there's a lot of free water for them to come and find the roots and infect. Um, depending on the pathogen, the temperature ranges are going to be different. Uh, so even though these two pathogens, Petium and Phytophthora, like wet conditions, Petium will be more prevalent under cool temperatures, while Phytophthora will be more prevalent under warm temperatures. So the reason why we call them wet rots is because when you go into a field that has uh, issues with Petium and Phytophthora and you pull the samples out of the ground, uh, the, the ones exhibiting symptoms, they're going to be, uh, their stems are going to be mushy. This is going to be a mushy uh, rot. Uh, so those are some of the symptoms we're going to see. Uh, mushy uh, 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 decay, uh, seedling damping off where the plants are coming out of the ground and they die uh, right there and then. In the case of Phytophthora, Phytophthora can actually infect soybeans anytime during the growing, uh, during the growing cycle. So, um, uh, later on, uh, the symptoms of phytophthora are identified by the presence of these uh, brown discoloration that can extend from the uh, top root up in the stem, several nodes. Um, and then um, the symptoms from Petum and phytophthora are actually very similar. By just you know, visually inspecting the field, it is very hard to tell whether it's one or the other. You really need to send these samples out to a lab for identification um, to, to properly diagnose what is going on. And keep in mind that sometimes uh, the damage that we see might not even be related to phytophthora and petium. It might just be related to those waterlogged, oxygen-deprived conditions that the plants are, going, are growing in. Uh, so then the next slide here is... Uh, it's uh, for dry rot. So rice of tonia and fusarium are two good examples. They're called dry rot because unlike the mushiness that we get with uh, petrum and phytophthora, these are going to be kind of harder, uh, drier uh, rot. Um, so um, rice of the conditions that are favorable vary a lot. So for example, in the case of rice of tonia, different strains of the fungus have different temperature requirements. Uh, some of them might like it wet, some of them might like it dry, uh, but warmer conditions seem to be uh, more of a common ground uh, temperature-wise. Um, and the same thing for Fusarium, the conditions that are going to be favorable will vary with, uh, with the, um, the race or the uh, species of the, of the fungus. Uh, in terms of uh, plant symptoms, so one of the um, 
one of the more characteristic symptoms of rhizoctonia is these reddish brown uh, lesions that form on the stem and the tap root. Some of those lesions may be sunken, as you can see here where the red arrow is pointing to. Some of those lesions may be sunken and may girdle the stem. Uh, in, the case, in the case of Fusarium, uh, we get these light to dark brown uh, lesions on the tap root. The tissue may shrivel and, um, and appear dry rotted. Uh, when we look above ground to the, to the leaves, um, some of those leaves are going to be, uh, are going to shrivel as well. Uh, and we're going to have uh, some scorching on those upper leaves. So those symptoms are associated with, uh, with uh, Swisterium. And then I have sovereign death syndrome in here, uh, even though this is a pathogen that we see later on after flowering. This pathogen actually infects uh, soybean roots early. Um, so this is a pathogen that's associated with early planting, but it's not necessarily a calendar-driven uh, type of planting. It's the conditions, those cool and wet conditions uh, that are associated with early planting that are, are ideal for uh, sudden death. So last year was a good example where uh, we didn't necessarily plant uh, early. We actually planted a little later than normal because of all the, you know, the struggles, the wet conditions that we had. And even some of those uh, um, beans that went in the ground in late May, uh, some of those fields is, uh, still experience uh, sudden death syndrome because the conditions were conducive uh, to uh, infection by this pathogen. So um, another uh, favorable condition is uh, uh, fields that have a good pressure of soybean cysts. And so feeding by soybean cysts may open an entry point for these pathogens to come and infect those roots. And compaction as well. So if you look at a field uh, with uh, pressure of uh, sudden death later on and you look at those foliar symptoms, Usually we start seeing those foliar symptoms in those compacted or low laying areas of the field first. Uh, when it comes to symptoms, so um, uh, in signs, so as you can see here on the picture on the right, um, we see these blue colors in there. That is a, a, the blue fungal colonies. Uh, these are hard to see all the time, but if you take the sample when the soil is moist, um, if you pull out those, those, uh, those plants when that soil is moist, you might be able to see uh, these blue fungal colonies. If the soil is dry, you might not be able to catch that really nice sign of Southern Death Syndrome. Um, then, um, even though, like I said, the, the, the pathogen infects early, after flowering, usually if you have a rain event or heavy rainfall at flowering, uh, that will promote uh, the, the appearance of these foliar symptoms. And the characteristic thing about sudden death is this intravenial chlorosis and necrosis um, that we see on those leaves. Those leaves will eventually turn brown and fall off the plant. Furthermore, if you split those stems open, um, if it's, you know, sudden death is the culprit, you're going to be you're going to be seeing that the woody portion or the bark of that stem will be brown while the pith uh, remains clear or white uh, this is a very key characteristic of uh, of southern death that can help us set it apart from another uh, sister pathogen uh, it's called brown stem rot it's also a stem disease on soybeans that produces the same intravenial chlorosis and necrosis uh, but uh, when we split the stem, uh, the stems open, if it's brown stem rot, what we're going to see is the opposite. So the woody portion will be clear and the pest will be the, the one that's brown. Uh, and it's important to make the distinction because um, the sudden death syndrome will result in root rot. Brown stem rot will not result in, uh, result in root rot. And we currently do not have any seed treatments labeled for brown stem rot, but we do have a couple labor, labeled for Southern Death Syndrome. So Southern Death Syndrome is another one of those pathogens that can survive in the soil and residue for several years. Uh, and, the, and, and one of the, the difficult things too is that even if we're on a corn soybean rotation, corn is, can actually harbor uh, these pathogens as well. 
uh, it doesn't, sudden death doesn't necessarily cause a disease on corn, but, uh, but corn can be an alternate host for this pathogen. Uh, so a crop like alfalfa, for example, will be a, a non-host crop where we can actually reduce the amount of that inocular by rotating to uh, alfalfa. And then the last one I wanted to talk about is soybean cyst. Um, and this is, I left it for last, but this is actually the number one most detrimental uh, pathogen on soybeans. Um, it's also what we sometimes refer to as the silent pathogen because, uh, you know, soybean cysts might be present and we might not see any above ground symptoms. Um, sometimes we're most likely to see above ground symptoms when the plant is under other stressors. So usually in dry or hot uh, years, uh, those uh, those other stresses will will trigger above ground symptoms. So some of the symptoms that are associated with soybean cysts can be uh, yellowing and stunting uh, above ground, uh, but they don't always show up. And then we start seeing declines in our yields. Uh, that it, that can be a red flag for something going on uh, underneath on those roots. So it's called soybean cyst. Uh, the cyst that you see here on the left, on the bottom left, it's actually the female of the, of the pathogen. So that cyst, when it's old, it's gonna be kind of hardened. Um, the main purpose is to provide a house for the eggs. As you can see, those cysts are gonna be filled with eggs. Uh, those eggs will hatch. Um, they will turn into, into these microscopic uh, uh, worms, the nematode. Uh, will molt a couple of times outside the, outside the roots. Then the second instar um, soybean cyst will enter those roots, molt a couple more times inside those roots, and then you have the female uh, protruding out of those roots. So that female is going to be the cyst that is attached to those roots. The males are actually the only ones able to leave those roots, and the males are going to leave those roots and go and find a female to, ma uh, to mate with. And so the female will put out this mass of eggs, those eggs will hatch, and you know, there's gonna be a new generation um, in that field. We can potentially have about four generations per season, depending on the temperatures. It takes about uh, 28 to 32 days for one generation to complete its cycle. Um, so the, the damage, is, it's mainly because uh, these uh, uh, soybean cysts can interfere with the water and nutrient uptake, uh, nodulation, and nitrogen fixation. The different color cysts that you see here on the, on the picture in the center, um, it's related to the age of the cyst. So usually when those uh, females poke out of those roots, they're going to be, those young cysts are going to be a white color. And as they age, they're going to turn into a, a, a light orange all the way to uh, kind of like a darker brown uh, color. The oldest cyst will be, you know, that darker color. And so the best time to look at the cysts on the roots will be about six to eight weeks after planting. As the roots age, uh, those cysts are going to come off those roots and fall in the ground, return to the soil. Um, the, the hard thing about managing soybean cysts is that the cysts can actually be viable and live in the soil for many, many years. Uh, so once you have soybean cysts in a field, it is always there to stay. So this is one of those pathogens where we can actually make some decisions on management uh, early on. The best way to know what kind of population you're dealing with is by taking soil samples in the fall and uh, after harvest, but before tilling the ground, this is recommended to do about every four years. And so you collect several cores, about six to eight inches deep, mix it all together, and you can send those samples out to a clinic where you are gonna get a count, an egg count. So based on the number of eggs that you find per uh, X amount of soil, you can have an idea for how heavy the pressure is and how uh, bad the, the potential for economic damage is from these pests, okay? Uh, so some of the things that we use to manage can be rotation to non-host crops, mainly to kind of reduce the number of those eggs over time, the longer the rotation. 
the 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 higher the impact on those uh, on the number of those cysts. Uh, there's also, um, you know, resistant varieties, the use of resistant varieties and switching uh, sources of resistance. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. And then seed treatments can help a lot to protect those soybeans in, in situations where you do have um, some decent pressure from these pests. So, um, you know, we, we reviewed some of the main targets of those uh, seed treatments, some of those pathogens that will affect um, early. So we know, you know, when we look at the disease triangle, we know that if we have that infectious pathogen, uh, if we have a susceptible host, and it's important that I mention that different varieties of soybeans uh, vary on their uh, resistance or susceptibility to some of these early, early season pathogens. Uh, when you look at your seed catalog, you're going to see that, you know, there's usually ratings, ratings for certain uh, certain pathogens on that uh, specific variety, you're most likely always going to find a rating for Southern Death Syndrome. Um, and uh, Phytophthora is probably going to tell you uh, if there is a resistant, uh, resistant gene or a type of resistance to Phytophthora in that field. And it'll also tell you uh, which source of uh, resistance against soybean cysts is present. Um, and we also talk about the suitable environment and what a suitable environment is will vary with the pathogen. Uh, we know that you know a lot of these pathogens will thrive on the under those uh, uh, cool, wet conditions early. Um, some of them uh, will actually, in the case of rhizoctonia, you know, if you have some herbicide injury going on, those plants are going to be a little bit more prone to uh, damage or infection by rhizoctonia. So, so the temperature ranges and the, the, the uh, moisture conditions will vary with the pathogen, uh, but that suitable environment has to be present. And really all these three factors have to be uh, present in a field for that disease to really come in and, and, and develop. So areas where we have a susceptible host, where we have that infectious pathogen in that favorable environment, um, can have the ha a higher probability of an economic return. And I have a really nice graph to wrap up this uh, presentation here that shows how disease pressure can affect the break-even response that you get with some of these products. I don't want to bore you with going uh, through every single uh, name in this list. I just want to make you aware, if you don't know already, that uh, the Crop Protection Network put, puts out these uh, publications, and they are updated every year, on various topics on uh, disease management. This one in particular is on uh, seedling diseases. And so the nice thing about this, this resource is that this is an unbiased uh, rating for uh, third-party university data uh, for how the different active ingredients out there perform against some of these early season pathogens. Um, this information is pretty important, and knowing which active ingredients you have in your seed treatment package is super important because uh, not all actives are created equal. Um, some of these actives will only have activity on wet rot, and they will not have activity on uh, dry rot, for example, at the boxum, the third one on the table here, at the boxum will have good activity on pigum and phytophthora, but they will not have any activity on the dry rot or rhizotonia and cesarium. So knowing what you have in your seed treatment, it's, it's, it's critical to, you know, make the best out, out of your uh, seed protection. Um, luckily for us, a lot of the commercial products that we have out there are going to be a combination of different active ingredients. And so potentially, we're going to have active ingredients that target wet rot and those ones that target um, uh, dry rot. So a good example here, the first one, uh, you know, Acceleron will have metalaxyl that is uh, labeled for uh, phytophthora or the wet rot. And then you have the peroxide and peraclostrobin for um, uh, Rhizoctonia and, and Cesarium, for example. Same thing with Cruiser Max down, down here. So, uh, so this information and this publication, it's pretty helpful. 
And so what I did is that based on those ratings, I just kind of pull out a few names of some of the best uh, ratings uh, for the different pathogens. So uh, PCM and Phytophthora, these three active ingredients that the Voxan, Mephinox, and Metalaxyl are going to provide you pretty efficacious control. I do have a star sign next to Mephinox and Metalaxyl because PCM has become insensitive to these two active ingredients in some areas. Uh, there's another product, uh, Oxatiopiprolin, uh, which is also um, it's commercially uh, named uh, Lumicina, that has really good activity on Phytophthora only, and it's uh, kind of a different or new mode of action. And then for Rhizoctonia, we have a couple of strobi, uh, strobilurins, uh, Stoxystrobin, Stoxystrobin, and some SDHI chemistries that have pretty good ratings against this pathogen. And then Fusarium is a couple of triazoles and an SDHI that works really well. So remember that management of these includes variety selection uh, of, of uh, some of the most tolerant or resistant plants. Um, then uh, in, in the case of Phytophthora, we know that some of the varieties we have have uh, resistance to Phytophthora. If you're choosing a variety with partial resistance to Phytophthora, which will provide you protection against uh, various races of these pathogens, uh, seed treatments are actually going to be a great complement because the, the issue with these partial resistance to Phytophthora and some of these varieties is that the resistance uh, usually doesn't kick in until uh, later on, probably when the first trifoliate is coming up. And so you do need something in that seed to protect that, that crop for the first few weeks until, until that resistance uh, kicks in. In the case of SDS and SCN, we do have a few products available as well. Um, I will say that on the top table here for SDS, this product, uh, Mertex, is not uh, rated as good. Uh, it kind of provides poor control against SDS now. But we do have a couple of uh, specialized seed treatments for SDS, Alivo and Saltro that can provide good protection uh, from, from this pathogen. Alivo has been in the market for a few years, uh, and we know it works, and we know it performs well. Salter will be commercial uh, for the first time this next year, and because of that, I don't have access to a whole lot of uh, uh, university data just to see how it performs. But since both of these products, Alivo and Salter, are uh, in the same class of chemistry, I expect Salter to perform very similar to um, to a Uh And then for a soybean cyst, we have uh, various products. Some of them are biological products. Some of them are true synthetic products. Uh, Clariva um, here um, and is a, actually a soil bacterium that produces uh, some spores that attach to the uh, soybean cyst nematode body. And then they penetrate the body of the insect. They consume the nematode in, internally. They consume their insides. The body of the nematode will break, and so these uh, spores are going to be released out in the soil again and potentially create a new cycle of infection. Um, Alivo and Saltro, you see them in here again. Uh, so these two products have actually a rate and, uh, for suppression against uh, soybean cyst nematodes as well. Um, and we have uh, Avicta, which is a, you know, a true uh, synthetic product that affects uh, uh, chloride channels and in, in the insect uh, nervous system and the nematode nervous system. And then we have a couple of biological products in here, uh, soil bacterium, uh, Votivo and Avail. Uh, Votivo pretty much works as a repellent. Uh, it doesn't have really true nematicidal activities in, in terms of it doesn't kill the nematode, but it provides a barrier on those roots to protect from, from damage by soybean cysts. And some of the university work actually has shown really promising results. Uh, with a VICTA, we can get about a 0.5 to 8 bushel per acre um, increase uh, in moderate to high soybean cyst pressure. And something similar has been observed with Botivo too. So these products do uh, look very promising in terms of protecting uh, yields. So the question is, are fungicide seed treatments necessary? And I will say compared to insecticide seed treatments, I think fungicide seed treatments are a lot more necessary. The reason being is that when you look at that triangle, 
uh, environment plays a big role on disease development. And so if you have environments that are conducive to, uh, to these pathogens, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're going to be uh, causing a lot, of, a lot of yield issues. And it's very hard to predict what kind of conditions we're going to be planting in. So that's the time when um, in, uh, fungicide seed treatments play a big role. And you can see here in this table that some of the pathogens that we just reviewed here are considered some of the most yield-robbing significant diseases um, in, in our territory, so they can potentially uh, cause pretty detrimental um, yield damage. So I would say pay attention to the field history uh, in your, in your um, uh, tillage practices, uh, those uh, scenarios where we have continuous soybeans, where there's a lack of rotation to suppress the population of those pathogens can be high-risk scenarios. Uh, if you're planting susceptible varieties, um, and, you know, sometimes you want to plant a susceptible variety because they're better uh, adapted to your area or they yield better. Uh, and so planting those susceptible varieties uh, uh, can really benefit from, uh, from putting a, protect, a protection or a, or a seed treatment um, early on. And then the last graph I had here is, you know, your, uh, your return on your investment from putting that seed treatment. So when we talk about, um, you know, how the disease pressure affects that return on the investment, the higher the disease pressure, the, the higher the likelihood of getting a, a break-even response. So the first graph on the top left in here, at no disease pressure. If we look at a product uh, that costs $13 per acre uh, at a price of $7 per bushel in soybeans, we only have about 37% uh, probability of recovering the cost of that fungicide. That probability goes up when the disease pressure increases, so now we're closer to a 7, 70% on the low disease pressure, and then under high disease pressure, that probability goes up to about 87%. So the disease pressure will really drive that yield response. Uh, so with that, if you um, have any questions, I'm happy to take it. I'm sorry I took uh, long. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. I've um, got a few questions that did come in. Uh, the first one being, uh, as it relates to the bait stations, um, from the wireworm standpoint, does that station also provide help for detecting uh, seed corn maggots? Uh, no, that I know of. Uh, the, the, the thing is that you got to remember is the seed corn maggots will be overwintering at the pupa. The pupa is not really going to move or feed or anything. Uh, and then you have the adults uh, that are going to be flying. So because the bait is buried, very unlikely those adults or those flies are going to be um, encountering uh, that bait at uh, the timing when you're setting up this bait station. So wireworms will be the, the target. Okay, thank you. Uh, question number two, as it relates to the manure, does fall or spring manure application increase uh, the concerns of the wireworm for corn and or soybeans? Uh, so uh, so as far as I know, the, the one pest that, that from all the ones I cover, the ones that can really be impacted by manure are seed corn maggots, um, just because the flies are going to be attracted to it. I really don't have much knowledge of uh, how manure can affect um, uh, wireworms. And, and I'm thinking if you're putting that manure way ahead of planting, um, you can potentially, you know, skip the, the, the potential for damage by some of these pests. But I know seed corn maggots will be affected by manure. I don't think uh, uh, wireworms uh, will. Okay, excellent. Uh, third question uh, is, is it kind of relates to the active ingredients for both uh, insecticide pieces of the seed treatment and diseases. Uh, are there any new chemistries coming down the pipeline? Are there any new chemistries? Um, you know, I know there is a new product from, um, I think, Syngenta, but uh, for Petium, I think. It's for those some of those uh, wet rots. So, but right now, I think the little bit of information that I've seen is for corn. 
I don't know that uh, that there that that there's much uh, data on soybeans or if they're even thinking about uh, labeling on soybeans. So and that's a different mode of action and everything. Um, I don't know how far away we are from they are from um, you know launching this product commercially, but that's the one I have knowledge on for for Pethium specifically. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question uh, relates to white mold. Uh, in some areas, white mold is more of a uh, consideration. Do you have any recommendations on best management practices for white mold? Yeah, so um, so white mold, um, it's, uh, it's one of those pathogens that um, can be pretty affected by the environment, right? Uh, so, so usually, you know, if you've had a history of, of fields with wine mold, you know that inoculum is going to be there because they overwinter as, uh, you know, sclerotia, that black, those black structures, that sclerotia will fall into the ground and then germinate and give rise to these apothecia, which will release spores the following season. Um, I know this is a pathogen that's kind of uh, cool and, and, and more, you know, kind of cool and moist conditions is what it likes. Usually if you have um, dry, and it infects through the flowers. So usually if you have a dry type of season during the, you know, during the growing season, you might not have too many issues with, with wine mold. Um, but some of the practices will be um, uh, uh, row width. So the pressure uh, is going to be a lot less on those uh, closer rows than the wider rows. There's also a lot of in-season fungicides that can be sprayed. And, and the nice thing about wine mold is that there's actually an app where you can kind of forecast the risk for or potential for wine mold to, to cause problems based on the environmental conditions and your row closure and all of that. So that can help you you know, decide on whether to put in season uh, applications. I know that there is a product that you can actually spread on the on the ground. Uh, it's called Content. It's a biological product. I've actually heard really good experiences from that product. But this is a product that you have to spread on the ground, either in the with your fall herbicide the previous year or with your spring herbicide program um, early in the early in the season. And so that product will actually prevent that uh, sclerotia uh, uh, from germinating and, you know, preventing, reducing the number of spores that go in in the cycle. So there's a, lo a lot of really good tools uh, on why mold that will be, um, be effective at preventing or managing the pathogen. Yes. Excellent. Uh, one last one here, maybe. Um, with uh, soybean growers planting soybeans earlier in the season, regardless kind of where they're at within the state, uh, the biggest concern is SDS. Um, a lot of mm -hmm. folks are promoting the, the Olivo or the new Saltro coming out from Syngenta. Um, what's your takes on the effectiveness of those type of products? So, um, you know, I have seen really good protection in the sense that it's not like they're going to completely eliminate the, the, the pathogen from infecting your soybeans. But what I have seen really, really, uh, really nice, a very nice difference is that these, these products uh, will delay the onset of those foliar symptoms, which is really what you ultimately want from a product like this. Because the early onset of those foliar symptoms, that chlorosis and necrosis, uh, the earlier they show up, the higher the bigger, the higher the, uh, the impact on yield. So what these products really do is to try to delay the onset. So instead of showing up at R2, they might be showing up at R6 when, you know, your yield, your pods are, are already out there uh, forming and filling. And so the effect on yields is not as, as great. Um, you know, the, the plants may still get infected, but the yield reduction, it's not as, as heavy when you have some of these products that suppress um, the onset of those foliar symptoms. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, well, and from our internal to... trials, we'll, sorry, I'm just quick. Uh, from our internal trials, we've seen, I don't know, anywhere from maybe three to four bushel per acre. Um, protection with with a label is the only one we've looked at in our internal trials. So, yeah. No, excellent. Thank you for the info. 
So with that, I think we'll go ahead and uh, conclude our webinar on improving uh, yield potential while reducing early season uh, soybean risk. Uh, our next uh, El Soy Advisor webinar will be March 24th and can uh, register for that event or uh, basically review uh, any of the recording, the presentations of other soybean agronomic resources on the checkoff funded website, Ilso Advisor. Uh, thank you and have a great day. Thank you.